Justice of Justice of the Supreme Court of the State of Michigan. All persons having business with this honorable court are admonished to draw nigh and give attention to the court is now sitting. God save the United States, the State of Michigan, and this honorable court. Welcome to the uh, beginning of the court's new term. We had our inaugural uh, argument in the old uh, courtroom in the uh, Capitol this morning. Uh, so uh, we have introduced formally our newest colleague, the 111th Justice of the Supreme Court, but I will uh, introduce her again now that we're in our home court. Uh, I welcome publicly uh, Justice Larson to the court. She has truly been thrown into the deep end of the ice bath, um, having started at the beginning of the month and having two weeks later these arguments, and I can assure you that she is fully armed and dangerous. So, <laughs> um, For those of you who have not been uh, with us before or for a while, uh, the calendar cases are allotted uh, 30 minutes each per side, and um, the first five minutes of which are uh, insulated from uh, probing questions by me and my colleagues. You'll appreciate that. I would suggest to you, therefore, in those minutes that you give uh, the most significant outcome determinative reasons why you think you should prevail. And with that, we'll call the first case, Hodge versus State Farm. Good morning, my name is Richard Shaw. I appear on behalf of the plaintiff appellant, Linda Hodge. Together with me at council table is Manpreet Gill, who is assisting me, uh, and I hope I won't need any assistance. We'll see what happens. This case involves Linda Hodge, who asserted a right to certain no-fault benefits. The case was filed in the district court with a jurisdictional limit of $25,000. The jury found that plaintiff was entitled to $85,957, after which the district court entered a judgment for $25,000. The circuit court reversed. The Court of Appeals affirmed the circuit court's reversal. This court undoubtedly perceives many of the issues that are raised by the Hodge decision. Is an ordinary creditor barred from bringing a suit for $25,100, expecting to receive only a judgment of $25,000? Suppose a creditor has bills of $23,500 at the time of filing, but by the time it gets to trial, the bills amount to $25,200 is the creditor allowed to waive the additional $200? Suppose the creditor has two bills for $15,500 and $9,800. How does he present these bills? Because as simple math shows, if you add those bills together, they add up to more than $25,000. Is the problem solved by presenting a jury verdict form to the jury that says, Enter on line 23 all bills owed by the defendant to the plaintiff. Enter on line 24 the number 25,000. Enter on line 25 the minimum of those two numbers, and that will be your verdict. Does that solve the problem? There are so many issues, no doubt this court has thought of other issues. There is a simple solution to all this, of course, and that is to reverse. Reverse upon the understanding that a plaintiff is entitled to bring suit in the district court in the full and complete knowledge that the plaintiff will receive not one penny more than $25,000. The amount of bills are irrelevant. The jury does not make an award. The judge, through the judgment, makes an award for the plaintiff. The jury is, in some sense, merely advisory. And this is no surprise to, any peop- to anybody who has considered either the Medical Malpractice Act 
or the Product Liabilities Act, to the, which, and by that I'm referring to the caps, where the jury has no knowledge what the cap may be, and it is only after the jury has rendered a verdict that the judge enters a verdict that reflects the cap, the statutory cap, of course, plus inflation. I hope to demonstrate that the trial court did have jurisdiction and trial counsel properly invoked the trial court jurisdiction. I want to dwell on one case in particular from the state of Michigan, Krawczyk versus DAIIE. At that time, the jurisdictional limit was, was $10,000, and the Court of Appeals determined, skipping the earlier courts, the Court of Appeals determined that profit-sharing income is no part of wage loss under the no-fault law. The Supreme Court reversed. The numbers are critical. Because the medical was $745, the ordinary wage loss was slightly more than $7,000, and the profit share wage loss was over $4,000. A little bit of arithmetic. The sum of these numbers was $11,812, although the jurisdictional limit in the district court was $10,000. What happened? I'll tell you what did not happen. When the Supreme Court reversed the Court of Appeals and said, yes, profit-sharing wage loss is part of wage loss recognized by the no-fault law, this court did not say, oh, and now we're remanding it back to the district court, and by the way, district court, enter a verdict of zero. That's what did not happen. It was obvious to anybody who's read that case that when the Supreme Court remanded, either of two things were going to happen. Counsel, good afternoon. I just really have a question that I really have been trying to understand about this. Yes, Your Honor. How does this benefit the client? How is this advantageous to the client? Thank you for asking. I see that I stepped up here without bringing my reading glasses. Excuse me for just one second. Not that I need them to answer the question. I thought you would see it clearly, though. No matter how myopic, I'm going to do my best to see and answer clearly. See, it makes you feel better. My reading glasses wouldn't help me either, so. I understand. How does it benefit the client? In my brief, I discuss at some length the possibility that a lawyer may perceive the district court as a more advantageous venue. Certainly, if you can collect attorney's fees, it is. Well, attorney's fees are available in any court. I'm not sure. Am I missing a point, Judge? No, I think there is where you're capping your client's recovery, but able to recover the full measure of your attorney's fees. It seems to have some conflict potential. I take your point. I think that's really what Justice Bernstein is asking you. How is a lawyer who serially files in the district court with a cap on recovery, how is that advantageous to clients whose recoveries could be more if they were filed, these same suits were filed in the circuit court? I understand, and I'd like to address that. On an abstract level, it is certainly possible, and I would submit in this case not only possible, but the fact that the trial attorney perceived the district court as a place where he would have a better venue and a place where he was more likely to achieve a positive income. And you may have read in my brief that I talked about the nature of what we call expected value. So that if one might be in the circuit court and have a potential outcome of $40,000, $50,000, $60,000, but with a probability attached to that of only 5%, one might very well choose the district court upon the thinking that one has a 90% to 95% chance of winning $25,000. This is a legitimate factor for a lawyer to consider. 
I can go on and I can discuss in some detail why the lawyer in question chose the district court. I will warn you in advance, it is not a matter of record. But we don't want to hear that. Then you don't want to hear it. Could I ask a different question, but related? Um, the jurisdictional amount of the district court is um, $25,000. The district court is a creature of statute, is not a court of general jurisdiction like our circuit court. And so my question is, when the legislature establishes its uh, jurisdictional um, maximum, on what authority may the district court award a judgment in excess of $25,000? It cannot. Well, uh, there's dicta out there in a number of court of appeals cases that says it can award 25000 exclusive of interest and attorney's fees. Oh, I understand. Now, my question is, how does, given the statutory limit, how does that dicta work? And what's the provenance of the court being able to enter a judgment for any more than $25,000? Your Honor, to, to the best of my understanding, it is not merely dicta. In the very case that I'm discussing, Project, there seemed to be no doubt that the district court was entering attorney's fees and interest and had determined and it's seen in the Court of Appeals decision especially, that those two items were not part of the jurisdictional limit. Why? That's what I'm I, asking. It's I, I, I'm asking now, I, it's, I think it may have been an assumption made, now I'm asking the frank question that the statutory limit couldn't have been made more patently clear. So my question is, whatever we've been saying in the judiciary about uh, other elements, in this case, no-fault uh, attorney's fees, I think, are construed as a part of the damages of the uh, insured. So we're really talking not about something that's ancillary to the recovery, but is core part and element of it. So my question is, tell me, explain to me how we get to say the district court can award uh, a judgment that is in excess of $25,000, even if it's in, uh, this, this uh, attorney fee thing out here. As I'm sure Your Honor can appreciate, and I do not mean to be evasive. Then don't be. <laughs> but, but it is only fair to point out that the question that you're asking has not been asked through at least Three appeals of which I am aware. I know, but now you're in the Supreme Court and we get to ask him. So if you I understand. Can, if you it's can, like the fourth time today he's been told that his question is irrelevant. <laughs> yeah. I'm just warning you. There but we, I'm there, persistent there be anyway. I, I because <laughs> because you, can, you can ignore my question, you can evade no, it, no, and no. I'll answer it without your help. I'm trying to at least uh, uh, take some solace in the fact that I'm not completely prepared for a question which has not so far been part of this appeal until two minutes ago. Uh, with that in mind, I have asked myself the same question. Well, then you have with, thought with about regard it. to the statutory interest. Okay. It seemed to me okay. that with regard to judgment interest, there was a stronger argument. With regard to attorneys' fees, I've also asked myself that question, and the answer has always been, as was pointed out to me by a young man who, at the time, was with. He said, "Richard, I don't care what you think the logic is." Uh, the courts have been uniform in finding exactly what you are asking about uh, this morning. And you're asking me this question, if we were to write on a blank slate, might a court but reach we a are. different conclusion? That's why I'm asking, because we are. Th this whole case uh, is confounding because we've had differing outcomes about what it means to uh, to stay within the jurisdictional amount of the district court. Many of the courts until this court, uh, Court of Appeals decision, have recognized the addendum clause is the determinant. This one has made a different decision. So it's all open here. It is. But the question arises, well, how can you award any more than that? 
And it, it, I, you, I, you it, asked it, the question yourself about the attorney's fees. What, what answer did you give yourself? I gave myself this answer. Precedent is very important. And but, not, but none of it's binding on us. No, I, I do understand that. Not and only is it not binding, but it's, it's really never given us a reason for it. There's, there's, there's no rationale, there's no logic to it. It's just something where costs and interest turned into cost, interest and attorney's fees, especially when attorney's fees are statutorily uh, provided for and appear to be an element of damage. I do understand, and notwithstanding that I don't have a clear answer and have not prepared for that question, I would like to at least point out one thing, that no matter what that answer is, that won't resolve the central issue before this court. And the central issue before this court still will be what happens when the potential damages, which I sometimes in my brief call the injuries, what happens when the potential damages or injuries exceed the jurisdictional limit, whether they are because there are attorney's fees, and I'm not so sure that there are any attorney's fees in this case. But, but your answer would be you reduce it down to 25,000. If we conclude that attorney's fees are part of damage, how do you decide what the client gets, what the attorney fee is, what is the damage from the proofs of the jury versus the finding of a reasonable attorney fee afterwards? So if we go down that road, it presents a very large problem, and that's where we're looking for some help from you. And, and indeed it may. I would think that the contract between the client and the attorney would be fundamental towards resolving that. So um, I, I can't understand how if an attorney signs a contract that says my fee is one third after cost, how the attorney could hurt the client by expecting, by the client getting any less than two thirds I've, of the I've deflected the you from the core of your argument. Go ahead. Yes, Your Honor. Well, Mr. Shaw, can I? divert you from the core of your argument as well. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'd like to follow up on Justice Bernstein's initial question because it seems to me really in one sense to be at the core of your argument, and that is what should this court, as the custodians of our one system of justice, think about a circumstance in which another of that system's custodians, namely the bar, is content to discount the value of his litigation by 85% consistently in order to appear before one level of court within our system rather than another level of court. Should there be on the part of this body here any concern at all that this is saying something significant about the nature of uh, the equal pursuit of the rule of law within our judiciary? I see this as being a pretty fundamental question. And yet, Your Honor, in this and other cases that have come before you or are waiting to come before you, uh, well, <coughs> this case, for uh, I'm, not, I'm sorry, the companion case to this 85%. case. 85%. Your Honor, the case has gone from the district court to the circuit court to the court of appeals to this court remanding back to the court of appeals as if on leave granted and back here, and at no time has there been a suggestion until uh, in the last month or so, has there ever been a suggestion that there was any impropriety on the part of the attorney. But I well, will, just my Judge Colombo but I challenged that, didn't he? No. Okay. No, Your Honor. I think if I believe my I'm quite familiar with the Colombo decision. question is not necessarily premised upon any propriety, impropriety either. I didn't suggest that the question here was impropriety. I asked you whether there's some evidence of something deeply awry, deeply gone wrong in our system by the fact that some members of the bar would consistently speak with their clients and provide them with the counsel that apparently has been provided in this case, that we are better off going to another judicial venue, not on the basis that Judge Smith is here or Judge Jones is there, but simply on the basis of the court. Your Honor, isn't that, isn't if, that if, something if we I'm should be correct concerned in about? believing, uh, it, 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 we, instead of continually referring to him as trial counsel, if I'm correct in believing that Mr. Fortner 
perceived the racial makeup in the district court as far more advantageous to him than the racial makeup in the circuit court, then not only do I not see that this is something that means that the court system is going awry, I see this as a situation where the attorney is looking out for the best interest of his client. Now, I hasten to add, this is not my determination. I do not do trial court uh, work, and I do not practice in either the 36th court or the circuit court except for motion practice. But if it's true that the circuit court, and we know it was true, that the circuit court had disproportionately less African Americans in the jury system, and certainly we know that it was true, I, I don't know what it is now, and if it's true that an African American plaintiff has a substantially better chance of, of relating to a jury in the district court, and that the claim by this person will resonate with the jury in the district court, then this attorney has done exactly what he should do. And Your Honor, if it turns out that, he, now he could be wrong, understand, I am not vouching for him, and he's not my client. Linda Hodge is my client. Linda Hodge is hoping that this court will reinstate her judgment from the district court. That's my goal here. I my goal is not to critique the judicial system, it's not to defend the judicial system. Can but I jump I, in on the same, the, I, I think that, I think that, um, I, I understand your, and take your point. Um, I think it's, obviously, there are a complicated set of factors for that an attorney has to consider, and I could imagine a set of factors that would make filing a case um, close to the limit, or a case maybe even slightly above the limit, but with, you know, you, where you were worried about how your client might relate to it. There, there might be a number of factors that would make some lawyers file some cases in some courts instead of others when there's a choice. But I think even you would have to agree that 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 it, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't be true um, necessarily if the case was significantly above the limits, like the numbers Justice Markman was talking about here, where where you really intend to prove one hundred and sixty thousand dollars worth of worth of damages, um, and just assume that the liability question was was solid, you didn't have a concern about that. Um, that then then it does raise some of these bigger questions that we're concerned with, and I think. Um, I mean, you tell me, but my understanding is that the, 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 it, the, it, in the district court, the attorney, there, there is no case evaluation. So the, the, the offer of judgment is the way in which the attorney fee award is, is determined. And so there is a significant advantage to the attorney in filing in the district court that may or may not influence how the attorney thinks about the strategic questions you're talking about. And what, what if anything, should we do about that? I, uh, first of all, I, I think it's important to state that the liability is not necessarily solid. I was just playing a hypothetical. I, I understand. Because that's how we can figure uh, out where our lines if are. If the liability were solid, certainly that would point in the direction of making it less and less reasonable to file in the district court. Right. On the other hand, if the and liability is I understand that's a subjective question, slim, and that's hard for us to evaluate post hoc. Like, I get all that. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, and as I said, I am not here to vouch for the decision that was made. I am only here to vouch for the abstract notion that one could under the right set of circumstances, make that decision. And I do agree that there is tension between what is good for the lawyer and what is good for the client. I have actually thought about, in, in my past life, I was an economist. But I counsel, isn't the, but counsel, isn't, the, isn't the attorney really discharged with the responsibility of determining strategy? I mean, that, that's the attorney's responsibility. So explain to me how you would imagine a conversation going where the attorney is talking about the strategy and what they're going to do, and a verdict comes back, which is substantially higher than the $25,000 limit. You know, what is the conversation that kind of takes place with the client before they decide to file in the district court? How would that conversation, like, how do you env envision that conversation going? 
How does that conversation go? Of course, there's no matter of record, but I take it I'm being asked to conjecture. And my conjecture, and perhaps I'm a Pollyanna, my, poly, my conjecture is that there is absolute full disclosure with the client, and you say to the client, this is how I perceive the situation. There are significant bills well beyond that of the jurisdictional limit of the district court. But I perceive it as a very close case as to whether we will persuade a jury that there is, that, that you are entitled to any recovery whatsoever. And since I am going to continue to be a Pollyanna, I would hope that the attorney would also say, and I wonder how many attorneys do this ever with their clients, I'd like to tell you about potential conflicts of interest between my fee, uh, fee for services and just as I would hope an attorney would immediately say, I charge by the hour and I want you to know it's in my interest to get as many hours as possible before I move for summary disposition. I hope I'm not re showing too much cynicism. But I thought you were Pollyanna. I know, I, I go back and forth, Your Honor. Excuse me one second. Mr. Shaw, so, <clears throat> perhaps my first question was a little bit overly administrative because we can't really realistically expect to solve all the problems of the judicial system in, in, this, in this venue here. We have administrative procedures and administrative hearings and many of the questions that I think were implicated by what I had said earlier perhaps better considered in our administrative venue. But I think this is a very practical question. I think it is, is right, on, right on target in, in, in our consideration of this case. And it is where there is a confused or uncertain jury, and they've been known to arise in the past, when you have such a jury, what is the different response on the part of an uncertain or confused jury that is facing a request for 160,000 and may be inclined to reduce that by 25 or 30 or 35 percent in that same jury that's confronted with uh, with with the council seeking $25,000. In other words, until that jury is willing to discount on the basis of their confusion what's being sought by 85 percent, that jury is going to award more than the maximum that's allowed in the district court. So in other words, up to that point, the, 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 the calculus that you're facing is, I may as well go for $160,000 because the jury can discount it by 10, 20, 30, 80%. They'll still be above the 25. However, if I would argue the 25 maximum, then they really could go below that 25 as, as deeply as 40, 50, 60, 80 percent. Isn't that something this court ought to be very concerned about? I think we should all be concerned about jury imperfections. In the appellate, in the published literature, one tends to assume that juries are perfect. And yet, in the practical literature that teaches people, how, by the way, I, I notice that my time has The longer been. you talk, the less you have to reserve. But can um, I finish this question? I, I agree, the jury system, system is impractical. Is that not a dishonest procedure to be more blunt about it? Is that not a deceptive procedure? Isn't that one in which the jury is being, uh, is being required to understand the case in a way that really isn't practically before that jury? I acknowledge that it is, uh, a tactic. I think that there are many tactics used by trial attorneys that I, in my ivory tower as an appellate lawyer, look at and sort of hold my head in disbelief. <laughs> this may be one of them. And I believe, that, and I submit to you, that this is a decision for the trial judge exercising the wide discretion that has allowed the trial judge uh, to make a determination on. Would you like to reserve some time? I would. Thank you so much. I think I was that supposed was a good to sit time at this point. Thank you.
May it please the court, James Houston appearing on behalf of State Farm with my partner, Casey Hainanen, and I'm accompanied by Mr. Gross, who is the uh, counsel for the amicus. <clears throat> How do you solve this problem? You file your case in a court of proper jurisdiction. You file your $25,001 case in the circuit court. That's how you solve this problem. This is not insoluble. This is not even difficult. And with the court focusing on <clears throat> the issue of the plaintiff in this case, I was trying to come up with a way, an example that, that might highlight what I believe about what's going on here. Let's assume in the Hodge case that the jury had come back and said, no cause. The jury comes back, it's a no cause for action, and the judge awards State Farm, let's say a $50,000 sanction under 3148.2 of the Michigan No Fault Act. At that particular point, the plaintiff who is now harmed by this particular verdict goes and finds another lawyer who didn't file a $163,000 claim in a court of limited jurisdiction and says to that lawyer, I've got a $50,000 sanction award against me, what am I to do? And that lawyer looks at that and says, you know what? Your $163,000 claim was tried in a case that didn't have subject matter jurisdiction. We're gonna get that set aside. I'm gonna file a motion. I'm gonna say that the statute is clear and because it was brought in the wrong court, you don't owe the 50 grand and we're gonna go back and we're gonna do our best to get you that $163,000 in the case, in, in the proper court, in a proper case. And that attorney would be right. That attorney would be correct. One of the things that, uh, that the court asked about, and, and I have the great honor to try cases on a regular basis, and I have been trying cases in the Wayne County Circuit Court since 1981. I have also had the great honor to argue to you folks before. But I will tell you, I was thinking back in light of some of these suggestions that that a plaintiff is prejudiced by going to circuit court. And I cannot remember one time in one of the jury trials I've had where my jury has been exclusively Caucasian. I just tried a case a couple of weeks ago in front of Judge Frizzard and I was thinking of the, the jury makeup. I, I hardly even pay attention anymore. But we were ethnically, racially, and gender diverse in that, ver in that jury. And it happens every time. So, Justice Markman, when you're suggesting there is something untoward going on here, I suggest that you are correct. I have not yet seen, in any court that I've been in, a suggestion that one of our circuit courts is a place you cannot achieve justice. And that seems to be the suggestion here. And, and candidly, as a member of the bar and as a, as a trial lawyer, I, I resent that suggestion because it's wrong. It's just flat out wrong. I believe that the legislature in this court have created these different courts for different reasons. The district court in, is supposed to be handling small claims matters and landlord tenant and those things that are circumscribed within the statute and no more. We don't even have automatic discovery in the district courts. It requires a petition. They are not built or designed for the handling of these types of cases. I would suggest to the court as well that this idea that you can waive these types of damages, that you can waive medical bills and attendant care claims and household services claims, that you waive them, the minute the suggestion is made that you waive them, that admits that there are damages asked for in excess of the $25,000 jurisdictional limit. That's what that waiver means. I am going to maneuver my way into the district court that I think I will be treated differently in by allegedly waiving these damages. It's a maneuver to create subject matter jurisdiction which none of us can create. I also suggest to the court that when you file a pleading that says my damages are less than $25,000, we as lawyers are confronted with 2.114, which says that we have to do our due diligence, to summarize, prior to the time that we file a pleading. We have to say that that pleading is based upon the facts. And in a PIP claim, 
in a Michigan PIP claim, we are talking about damages that are subject to arithmetic computation. Get your calculator out and add how many, uh, how many dollars do we have involved? How many hours? This is in the briefs and you've seen it. Counsel. How many hours are involved for attending care? What rate are you claiming? Counsel. What are the, I'm sorry, Your Honor. At least as far as I've been able to determine, as far back as 1855, there are very few legal principles in Michigan that I've found in the time I've been on this court that have provenance of more than 100 years in Michigan. Yes, Your Honor. But this is one that does. Where the jurisdiction depends on the amount, uh, it's determined by the claim as demanded by the plaintiff. That has been the unbroken standard, as far as I can tell, until the Court of Appeals decision in this case. Yes, Your Honor. Um, why do I care why a person might choose to limit its recovery to the uh, $25,000? And why, why uh, would, should we accept this, I think, fairly radical decision of the Court of Appeals to, to change a very uh, definitive way of determining whether somebody's within or without a court of limited jurisdiction to one that is more variable? Your Honor, I think there, there are two reasons for this. First of all, in that 100 years of jurisprudence that the court is talking about, they did not have to confront the realities of the Michigan No-Fault Act. And one of the realities of the Michigan No-Fault Act is that we are, insurers are responsible for lifetime medical. Insurers are responsible for attendant care for the duration of the injury. I believe that the problem you have, or not the problem, excuse me, but that the issue there, all of these, if you will excuse the colloquialism, all of these cases were on one and dones. They were tort cases, they were property cases, they were cases that had a finite beginning and a finite end. And when you look at that history of litigation and those decisions, they were not dealing with the situation that we're confronted with here. I don't even understand the point you're making. Well, because, my as I understand sure. it, there are, there are out-of-pocket expenses, but then there are also other ancillary uh, benefits that uh, flow from an, uh, an auto injury. Yes, Your Honor. Those are the only thing that, that gets litigated frequently if the insurance company doesn't pay the PIP benefits and so on. Uh, automatically is they litigate this and you get a determination whether the, the with, withholding of those benefits was proper or not. That's a liability determination. Yes, Your Honor. So I don't understand this argument that if you have that liability determination in the district court and a cap on the out-of-pocket damages, that it's, it, the insurance company is somehow uh, harmed that that liability determination isn't made in the uh, circuit court. Your Honor, I would suggest to the court that there is no cap on the damages once the determination of liability has been made. And, and I believe that that is a significant difference. If a determination is made in but the, the yeah, but but That's the point. That's a statutory obligation, not a jury-determined amount. PIP benefits, if, they're, if you're obligated to pay them, is not driven by a verdict from the jury. It's driven by the no-fault statute, is it not? It is. I agree. And the only thing that turns on it is whether you're, the insurance company is obligated to pay them or not. I agree with that. That determination well. can be made in the district court just as well as in the circuit court. This whole discussion started as we were relating to why we would change the century-long definition of amount in controversy. Like well, th this is why you're telling us we should look at something more because no fault wasn't around in 1855. Correct. And, and there, have, have, there has been case law, and I know it was cited by Mr. Gross in his amicus brief. There was a, there's an elegant phrase, I think. The value of the consequences of the action is a suggested uh, definition for a mountain controversy. And, and in that same context, how do we reconcile 2.114? 
If the pleadings are it, if that is the end of the question, why do we have a responsibility as attorneys to assert to the court at the time of the litigation that we have done our due diligence, that we have laid the foundation to know that our damages are less than $25,000. But, but if that's the problem, counsel, isn't that a problem for the bar? I mean, if, if your problem is that plaintiff's attorneys, uh, in your experience, if you think they aren't doing their due diligence, then that's a problem for the bar to police, not for us to change the 150 years of precedent. Isn't that right? Well, <clears throat> Your Honor, clearly there are bar implications to these considerations that we stand here with you today. But I would suggest to the court that when you're taking a look at what the real amount in controversy is, in the Hodge case, you've got $163,000 that is confessed to be the amount in controversy. I don't know that that even requires a change in the rule. I believe that if you stand up in front of a jury or you say to the judge or during discovery, we reveal that it's $163,000. The court is divested of jurisdiction at that point. So, but counsel, I just, this is, this is a really interesting point. I just, I want to have a little bit of an understanding of, of where you're going with this. Let's take away this case as an outlier. Let's say just in the natural course of litigation, you file your complaint, you believe that you're filing your complaint properly, and new information avails itself. New things are discovered, new things occur. And we're not talking about this situation. I'm posing just a hypothetical because we're kind of looking bigger than this case. What at that point should happen? You know, you're in the middle of this. You're going through the process. You've done the best you can to do your due diligence, but circumstances change. Diagnoses change. Things just happen. It's the nature of life and litigation. What would you suppose or what would your recommendation be um, for an opinion as it pertains to that situation? Thank you, Your Honor. I the court is absolutely accurate. I see these cases all the time. You start off with a case and someone needs a surgery halfway through the case and the damages go up. I believe that the court rules provide that the court has an obligation to continue to review the issue of subject matter jurisdiction. And because these are subject but to- the, Your theory means that subject matter jurisdiction is variable. It can never be determined at a particular point. And that's one of the, the wonderfully simple way that we've always, until this opinion in Michigan, determined what was within or without the subject matter. And my point further is, I don't see why a party can't say, in order to stay here in this court, I'm willing to, for, to, to forego the possibility of a higher recovery. And, and I guess the question then becomes, is foregoing the possibility of a higher recovery the way we determine the amount in controversy? It has been it until this case. And, and I'm suggesting to the court that because of the nature of these types of cases, it is not the proper way to do it. So when, what, what is I'm the sorry. proper way? So if we are gonna, if, if we wanted to write an opinion in your favor, yes. oh, give us a roadmap. How would we write that opinion? So. In other words, if the plaintiff pled 25,000, asked for $25,000 as the prayer for relief, and in the course of litigation it turns out that it's 30, is that now they're divested of subject matter jurisdiction? I submit to the court that yes, that's true. And, and that's true even how, though, how do, how, wait a minute, it's just a, a conundrum here, is there not? Because you can board $30,000 of, of uh, potential damages, but the jury doesn't have to award that. While is that is, right? You try these cases. I, I know do. That. So I know you'd know that that's yep. true. That is a correct statement, Your well, Honor. Well, then why in the world would we have a rule where the uncertainty of trial is such that if you're trying to get to the, the jurisdictional mat, uh, max, you're offering the jury lots of options to get you there. Why would that be an offense against the subject matter jurisdiction? Because the subject matter jurisdiction, as I understand it, according to the statute, is set on a dollar amount. And we have methods in place at this particular point whereby the court is required to continue to analyze its subject matter jurisdiction. With that being the case, it's, it is incumbent upon the court and the parties, and in this case we filed a motion in limine, but in general, it is incumbent upon the parties to review that for subject matter jurisdiction. And I suggest 
that the easier line rather than saying is thirty thousand too much is one hundred sixty thousand too much the easier line is to say subject matter jurisdiction is premised upon twenty five thousand dollars and during the course of discovery in a pip case if you find out that now there is a surgery for another hundred thousand dollars that the court has to transfer the file under two point two two seven to the circuit court for adjudication in the court of proper jurisdiction i don't see that as being a major problem especially because it's already within the body of the rules we're working through the you extra surgery is an easy case right and the harder case is am i going to prove 24 or 30 and then you know i hope i'm going to prove 30 but i might not i might only <coughs> prove 24. That, you know it, does it just then depend on like how much i prove how much the jury comes back when when do we transfer it i believe that you transfer it when the court and the parties are of knowledge that the claim has exceeded the $25,000. And you're right, the surgery is an easy one. Of course I picked an easy one. But let's take one that's, let's take one that the attendant care, as in this case, continues it to be claimed at 24 hours a day at $14 an hour, all the way through prior to trial. That number is subject, it, it's not hard to achieve. It's not as though we're dealing with pain and suffering and mortification and humiliation. What we're dealing with is actual arithmetic. How much is this claim worth? This well, is not a pain and case. suffering case. It's purely economic. Well, well, that's true in this case. But of course, we need to write an opinion that's going to govern this case and subsequent cases. Yes, Your Honor. Right? So what about the $25,001 case? That's what I'm worried about. And, and, and if, may I ask? If it's twenty-five thousand dollars, twenty-five thousand and one dollars of PIP benefits, because I, I suggest that there's a difference between a PIP case and a tort case. Tell me what that is. I've yeah. just described to you how I thought PIP was not a jury determined amount. Is it? <clears throat> PIP has to be a jury determined amount in some cases where there's a dispute, oh, Your Honor. In terms of of what the cost of the care is. Yes, the cost okay. of the care, that kind of thing. The jury has to determine and is given the That's discretion That's a liability, to make. sort of, a, I guess it's just right. a way of determining, okay, this is the, the cost of this care that the insurer is uh, obligated to pay. Correct, Your Honor. Okay. And a tort case, we're dealing with all those, and I don't even know that amorphous is the right word, but all of those types of damages that, that can't be determined and are left to the good sense of the jury. In this case, Your Honor, we've got, how much is it? What's my calculator say at the end of the day when I add up all the numbers? And am I over 25,000? And of course, the- So we should have a different rule for PIP cases than other tort cases, and it should <clears> be a mushy rule that's good for lawyers, but not necessarily clients or industry? Like oh, no, Your Honor. I, I, I actually believe, I, I cannot imagine a circumstance in which a $163,000 claim would be validly filed in a district court of limited jurisdiction. I cannot. I, I can't. What if, it, what if it were true, empirically, that 36 district juries were much more plaintiff friendly than even Wayne County juries? And Your Honor, I. And it was a case where you weren't confident about your liability, liability. allegation. But like you, you wanted to win, and 20, a, a sure 25 is a lot better than, a, you know, Discounted. really risky 160. I cannot stand before you all and say that I believe that the 36th District Court is a better venue than the Circuit Court for the County of Wayne, that there is more fairness in that court than there is in the 36th District Court. I confess that I have tried and lost cases in both, and I have. But Counsel, but, what, about, what about the efficiency argument? You know, looking at it from an efficiency basis, you know, based on this situation, if you have to do a venue change, you know, you're looking at a much longer duration of trial period, are you not? Well, your Honor, I, I understand the court's concern in that regard, but I guess working within the system as I understand it, uh, it is the obligation of the court, that is the district court and counsel, to determine on a continuing basis whether subject matter jurisdiction continues to exist. And then there is an obligation under 2.227 to remove the court, or, to, or I'm sorry, to transfer it, and that is already in place. Excuse me. It's already in place. It's not that I'm asking for a new rule or suggesting one to the court. And yes, it may not be as efficient as we would like, uh, but that's the system we have. And I suggest that, that that's already in place. Well, Counselor, you, you've 
you failed to mention, in my judgment, one very critical concept here. I'm not sure I agree that the rule for 150 years has been that the sum claimed or pleaded controls. I look at the federal system, and they have an analogous situation in which we've got diversity jurisdiction. I right. think the threshold level is $75,000 today. They have articulated a sum, uh, the sum controlled or pleaded rule for many, many years. But intermittent in those decisions have been the occasional case in which they've said, you know, even though we've said that it's the sum control or pleaded that controls, of course we haven't felt it necessary in each of those cases to mention that those sums plead, pleaded or um, claimed have to be made in good faith. Mm -hmm. That's been the critical factor. I wonder if that's not the rule that's prevailed. I don't know for sure, but I don't know. It's not clear to me what the rule is in Michigan or has been the rule of Michigan for 150 years. In one case by the United States Supreme Court dealing with diversity jurisdiction, the court has said, but if from the face of the pleadings, it is apparent to a legal certainty that the plaintiff cannot recover the amount, or if from the proofs, the court is satisfied that the plaintiff never was entitled to recover that amount, and that his claim was therefore colorable only for the purpose of conferring jurisdiction, the suit will be dismissed. It seems to me that if there's an answer, and that of course depends upon whether there's a problem, and I don't know that we, we've arrived clearly at that, but if there is an answer, it seems to me it's a fairly simple one, focusing on good faith. There's lots of things that have to be done within our legal system that have to be done with good faith, but I would suggest, or truthfully, but I would suggest that in many, many of those instances, it's not explicit that that has to be done, it's implicit. I wonder whether or not something that hasn't previously been a major problem is becoming an increasingly major problem within our system and may suggest the wisdom of making explicit what arguably has only been implicit in the past in terms of good faith. I appreciate that, Your Honor, and I, I suggest to the court, uh, not only do I agree with that principle, I looked at 2.114. What are we supposed to do as lawyers? We're supposed to tell the truth when we file those pleadings. That's what we're supposed to do. And there are sanctions in place if we don't. There are sanctions against the individual attorney and the party under that court rule. <clears throat> is if it we bad have made faith? I'm sorry. Is it bad faith then if I have a conversation with my client? I, I do the calculus. We have a $150,000 potential recovery in the circuit court, but a 5% pot probability of achieving it. Whereas in the district court, we have a 95% probability of achieving a liability determination, but a lower cap, $25,000. My client says, I'll take the greater assured chance. Now, how am I violating 2.114 when I've got a client who's fully advised of the premises, understands that they're taking a discount on what they might get in, in the circuit court, and they're willing to, to roll the dice in district court? Because, Your Honor, I think there's two problems with that. First of all, the amount of controversy is actually whatever it is that, is in, that has been submitted to the insurance company, for example. There's $160,000 in controversy. And the client and the But I'm willing to take less. No, I, I understand that. But are you then going to walk into court and say, I've got $163,000 worth of damages and all I can get is twenty-five grand, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, so you should give me that amount? Well, well tell me what, what the offense is. I'm trying to locate the offense. Certainly. If my client is, is rock solid, I know I can only get twenty-five. You get to go forward then and present the best case you can so I can get a $25,000 recovery, and uh, I as attorney present all my, my proofs, the jury comes back with whatever it comes, and if it's higher than 25, the court says, you get 25 back. What, what, is the, what is the harm, what is the wrong about that system? Your Honor, what I would suggest to the court is this. If the rules relative to subject matter jurisdiction are going to mean something in that context, do we not have to look at what the actual value of the case no, is? No, the actual value, once there's liability, and excess of 25 is 25. I don't, I, 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 that's why I'm having difficulty understanding 
your argument there's something fundamentally wrong about using the Adam clause mm -hmm. as the determinant of what the value of the claim is for the purpose of amount in controversy. And I guess, and, and, and I don't mean to be redundant, but if I tell the court that my claim is $25,000 or less, and I introduce evidence during the course of discovery that the claim is $163,000, and I argue to the jury at the time of the trial that it's $163,000, have I not maneuvered or fooled the system? Why do we have subject matter jurisdiction, I guess, then becomes the question. Let, let, me, let me ask a question that falls into that answer. Um, we're having problem as a court uh, concluding that the plaintiff shouldn't be permitted to say I'll take less for strategic reasons. And it's been a long time since I've been in either of those courts. I'm still having a hard time accepting the notion that Wayne County could be a 5% chance of victory while 36D could be a 95%, but everybody seems to be accepting that. But let's set that aside. All right, let's just set that aside. If we are having trouble concluding that a plaintiff can, should be permitted to say, I'm willing to take less to be here, that would create the amount in controversy as that amount. In writing our opinion, would it be appropriate to say, well, if you're going to say this is your amount in controversy, then when you try your case, you're capped at arguing that you only have $25,000 in damages. In other words, if you want that advantage, you can't go in and say I've got $200,000 in bills here because the minute you do that, the amount in controversy is not $25,000, it's $200,000 as you claim. But if you want to take the ride in 36D, you have to say, all right, I'm limiting myself to $25,000 and your proofs max out at $25,000. Is that a way we could write this opinion? Would that solve the problem, or is that going to create more problems for the but, practice? And, and I, I believe it will create more problems for the practice for two reasons. Looking back to what the district court judge ruled, she had suggested that um, to make the plaintiffs select which of the damages they would present at the time of trial would unfairly prejudice the plaintiff. So what what the defense is, is struck with, or stuck with, excuse me, is the fact that we're going to try a case with $160,000 in it without them selecting what the damages would be. Which $25,000 are we going to try? What difference does it make? It, it makes a difference, Your Honor, because if it's $25,000 worth of attendant care, then I discuss whether or not the price is reasonable, the number of hours is reasonable. If it's a medical bill, is it reasonable and related? Does it arise out of the defenses are, excuse me, <coughs> the defenses are different mm -hmm. in that regard. Mm -hmm. So and the intended I believe care carries on where the past medical bills don't. That's right? correct. The attendant care goes on and, and the claim is not over even with that. And, and this is essentially the foundation of why you say there needs to be a different rule for amount and controversy for PIP. I, it is. The claim doesn't stop. You know, I. And I'm sorry, you know that's not so right. as a ma are you, uh, what is it we saying? As a matter of law, PIP claims cannot be brought in the district court unless they are for only $25,000? I, I believe that's part of it, Your Honor. I think one of the things... I'm trying to understand sure. what the rule of law is here that you're arguing. I believe if we approach the a definition of a mountain controversy that evaluates the... Uh, actual value, the consequence of the outcome of the claim being the actual value, all that does is enforce and remind the courts that they have an obligation to continuously evaluate subject matter jurisdiction as do the parties. If and we, it doesn't even continue, have to be just hip claims. If we continue to rec recognize <coughs> the adamnum as the determinant, is there any outcome that you can foresee that would be helpful to you? I, I suppose the, you know, the fundamental problem is this. You would have to have a situation where the ad damnum included an admission by the plaintiff that they would not collect benefits or damages beyond this trial. They would release future benefits from that point forward because then there is no question of the value increasing over time. <clears throat> the verdict would, in effect, negate the, the, the statutory regime. 
That would be the only benefit. that would be the only way I could see it going forward that way, Your Honor. But that's a different problem than the one where I mean, the, uh, so then that's a problem for a thirteen thousand dollar verdict, right? Because that plaintiff might have continuing damages going for the rest of their life. It, Are you saying? I mean, this is like a whole new set yeah. of questions for well, us. I, I we thought that was worried about this one yet. This is I'm the sorry. ongoing insurance obligation theory yeah. that yeah. the amicus yeah. raised. Yes. But you didn't really you weren't really on this line, were you, in your brief? Oh, no, we did not. That was what uh, Mr. Gross submitted for Your Honor's consideration. Well, you were just arguing it. I, I thought I was responding. You're arguing it as it relates to how we determine the amount in controversy. Correct. Yeah. But That's what I was. I, I, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Sure, no, I'm sorry, Your Honor. I have a question, and, and we're, I'm just really grappling with this from the perspective of just different attorneys and how, to, how they're going to practice. Do you feel that you're conversely setting up kind of a situation where basically because of people being worried about malpractice, they're just going to automatically go to the circuit court. You know, let's use a hypothetical where if I'm trying to, I'm an attorney, I'm trying to file, do the best job I possibly can for my client, you know, ultimately would it almost be, would you almost be creating a certain malpractice situation where, well, what if I go into the district court, I reasonably believe I should be in the district court, but now I realize that there's a little bit more money that is being sought, it's a little different than I anticipated, so I should have been in the county court. So do you feel that there could be an unintended consequence where basically people are gonna go the other way and they're gonna wind up going into the county court and flooding the county court because if they were to go into the district court and these developments came through under your paradigm, there could be a potential malpractice situation? Your Honor, if I could answer that both from a practical and a theoretical standpoint. Practically speaking, I do not see uh, plaintiffs filing PIP cases in the district court. I just don't see it. Um, uh, there may be some circumstances, but that is not the protocol. I, I, practically speaking, I believe my brother and sister counsel on the plaintiff's bar would file their lawsuits when there is this type of controversy in the circuit court. Um, theoretically, I also have a problem with the idea that filing in the district court, filing a claim that continues to mature, if I might use that phrase, over time because of the lifetime portion of, of the No Fault Act should require someone going to circuit court because that's the way the system is set up. We have differentiated the courts that we practice in and we have set rules that um, distinguish between district courts and circuit courts and, and all the rest of the courts. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you for your time, all of you. Have a good day. Approximately two minutes. Two minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. First of all, Judge McCormick, you put your finger right on it. She's a if justice. Sorry? Justice. justice. Maybe I got demoted. I guess. <laughs> I, I annoyed you this morning. <laughs> yes, it turns out that a bill by a chiropractor is for precisely $8,000. That chiropractor could be, according to defendant's logic, along with amicus curiae, could be told, you must be in the circuit court because there's one-stop uh, shopping when it comes to uh, uh, no-fault benefits. And this is the case that would continue into the future, and they have no principle that stops that from occurring. I'd like to put my head into the jaws of the lion and ad address Justice Markman's point. Your Honor, it is true that the federal courts do look at the possibility of, some, of, of a plaintiff doing something in bad faith. And in fact, that's the fix case in this court. But there's a problem of conflating two analytically dissimilar situations. If I am pleading in a court of limited jurisdiction, my statement that I claim an amount not to exceed $25,000 is a solemn promise it is a covenant. No matter what you do, I won't take a penny more. On the other hand, if I plead in a court of unlimited jurisdiction, I am making an assertion of fact that has a truth, truth, false value, and can be disproven, again, like the fixed case. And that's the distinction, and they cannot be conflated. 
Thank Counsel, you so did much. I hear you correctly in your earlier argument that if we were to rule that the amount in controversy now is what it has been for you know, over 100 years, it's going to be the amount claimed rather than the amount uh, um, actually and finally recovered um, or, amount, or not based on the evidence or damages at trial, but, but the amount alleged, you would not object to us also finding that the attorney fee award should be considered as part of that uh, amount? I certainly do object, Your Honor. Yeah. However, in view of my lack of briefing on the subject, I must admit that Judge Young has put me into a quandary. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>